So I'll start with some opening comments. Um, first, some good, some good news tinged with bad news, and I will explain why it's good news tinged with bad news. COVID <laughs> hospitalizations are down in the state. Um, they are about, last week we reported there were 1,669, I think, I, I think that's what we reported last week. I'm trying to, uh, close to that, if, if not, that's, that was the Monday number. It might've been the end of the day, Monday number. And this week we have one, at this moment, we have 1,504 COVID hospitalizations. One caveat to that, which is that sometimes on Monday morning, there's some catch up reporting um, if people haven't reported over the weekend. So that number could go up a bit, but it, when we look at the Friday to Friday to comparisons, um, it also shows a bit of a decrease. So that is really good news um, that we see that decrease. And the reason, one, there are two reasons we think this is happening. One is we think Washingtonians are really taking this very seriously. We've seen an increase in the vaccination rates, the governor's order on masking, some of the other the county actions like the vaccine verification that's happening in a number of counties. Um, so we hope that people are taking this very seriously and are working to keep themselves from getting infected with COVID. And it looks like the case rates may be going down a tiny bit. Um, and I can show this data in a minute. The reason it is not good news is that one of the reasons the hospitalization rates are falling is that death rates are rising. And so that is a, that is a reason when you've got fewer people in the hospital is because some have died. And you all have probably heard that there's a number of counties that are either ordering additional morgue capacity through refrigerated trucks or working with their morgues to figure out how to increase capacity. Um, there are 30 COVID deaths in the state in the last 24 hours. Um, some of you were at the press conference with uh, King County Executive Constantine, where he was announcing the vaccine verification system. And he made a statement that I found really um, shocking, which was that in King County, uh, re someone dies of, of COVID um, once every eight hours. And in fact, according to Dr. Mitchell, there were five deaths in King County in the last 24 hours. So that's even more than once every eight hours. So that's, um, that is a way we do not want to be creating hospital capacity. This is despite giving people the best care that we have for COVID, which is still honestly not very good. Um, there's no, for people who think there is a cure and full proof, treat, full proof treatment for COVID that does not exist. So I want to just show you all in the state's COVID data dashboard in case you haven't seen it. Can, ever, can you can all see the screen? Does it look? Yeah, okay, great. So here is the death curve. So this is what I'm talking about over here. This is the, the real, we, what we said before is that the cases rise. So I'm going back to cases. Cases rise earlier and then hospitalizations follow by two weeks or so, which you can see that that's a little bit down, further down the, um, the time trajectory and then deaths follow that. And so we're seeing the spike in deaths very recently. So that's really sobering news. Um, and we hope that people will take it very seriously and understand that COVID is still a deadly disease. And the best way for that, for it not to be a deadly disease is to be vaccinated. And so continuing to encourage people to, to do everything they can to get vaccinated. Um, there are about 260 people still on ventilators in our state. That's some people who, that's a kind of a replacement because some people have died who are on ventilators and then more people are being put on ventilators. These are folks who are really sick. This is our last resort treatment. Um, and some of them will not survive, we know, uh, tragically. And it is a very, really want to emphasize to people, this is a very terrible way to die. Um, we would like to see nobody need, uh, need this level of care. Um, the border communities, as I mentioned, we'll hear from John and Dr. Getz, are especially bad um, uh, because they're taking in patients from across the border. Um, Oregon, I think, has done a very good job with COVID, really worked hard on its mask mandates and vaccine pushing, and so it's less of an impact there, although it does have some impact. But boy, for our Eastern Washington hospitals, Idaho is really challenging, um, and it's very frustrating for Washington hospitals to feel like we are the stopgap for um, ineffective COVID practices in Idaho, that there, we want there to be a mask mandate, we want there to be increased vaccinations. That care, caring for people who are coming across the border is causing people in Washington to not get the care that they need for um, other kinds of conditions, and that's a really serious issue. Um, you all have asked in the past, and this is a new topic, about monoclonal antibodies. And the, there was a change in the federal distribution system for monoclonal antibodies last week. So, 
hospitals had been ordered and other providers have been ordering directly from the manufacturers. The manufacturers, because of the spikes all across the country, are inundated with orders. And so they are going to return to um, a, an order system where the state gets an allocation and the state does the distribution. So our Department of Health has been, we did this previously, um, the Hospital Association Department of Health did it in partnership. Um, Department of Health staff that work on this are tremendous. We're very hopeful it will get sorted out soon, but there actually might be about a week or two even um, gap or blip in how the uh, monoclonal antibodies are distributed. And so people may have a tough time finding them in the next couple of weeks. A really good piece of news about monoclonal antibodies is that the federal government has approved their administration subcutaneously, which means just an injection. Um, there's it's a series of four injections, so it can be done in a lot more places. Prior, previously, it was just it was an infusion, so it was a you know kind of a full hospital outpatient type of service. And the fact that it's an injection can be done in pharmacies and clinics and lots of other places. So we're really excited about that and hope that more places will be authorized to do monoclonal antibodies. The last thing I will note is that the vaccine um, deadline is approaching for healthcare workers um, on October 19th. Hospitals have to have verified the vaccination status of their employees or approved an exemption and a modification and an accommodation, or the employee may no longer be providing care. Um, we are now the only vaccine that one could begin getting now and still be fully vaccinated by the October 19th deadline is Johnson & Johnson. The state has Johnson & Johnson, and so we are working to make sure our hospitals that want Johnson & Johnson, whose staff want Johnson & Johnson, that that's um, arriving to them as quickly as possible. Really appreciate the, stats, the state's partnership on that. Um, and we don't yet know how many hospital staff are not vaccinated. Um, maybe our panelists could share where they are at the moment, we plan to um, work with our hospitals to uh, try to understand that question probably around October 5th, 6th, 7th in that time period because October 4th is the last date to get Johnson & Johnson and qualify as fully vaccinated. Um, with that, I think I'll start with Dr. Mitchell, just giving us your view of, as you're trying to place patients, what is it looking like across the state? Where are you seeing the most uh, significant impacts and kind of the hot spots? Sure. Thank you, Cassie. Um... And I want to thank everybody for being here. And I do also want to thank Washingtonians for the, the focus and the work that they have been doing because we seem to be making, uh, making some progress. Um, as Cassie said, we have 1,504 patients this morning and that's down from the high of, of just over 1,700 patients, which, which occurred on September 9th. And so we are making progress in that sense Sadly, but expectedly, as Cassie mentioned, uh, our death rates are up um, up a bit. So that partially compensates for uh, some of the um, decrease in cases that we have in our hospitals. Uh, we've had 77 requests to, uh, for coordination to the Washington Medical Coordination Center in the past week. That number is actually down a bit also. Uh, our high was about 140 cases a week uh, when we went into the middle part of August, uh, when we were on the extreme, extreme uh, uh, high end of the surge happening. And so, um, and remember, hospitals reach out to the Washington Medical Coordination Center when they have tr already tried themselves to transfer their patients, their, their, their patient from the small and rural hospitals where we are getting over 90% of our requests from, and they haven't been able to, 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 to get the patient transferred where they need the care. Because remember, the small and critical access hospitals are where patients are meant to go and be stabilized, but they can't, be, they can't necessarily be fixed there. They can't have those procedures or those sur surgeries where they actually fix the primary problem. Those are done at the larger resource hospitals. And sadly, those resource hospitals are still all overwhelmed and all over capacity. And when they are um, um, overwhelmed, then things back up both within their hospital. And so patients arrive into their emergency department, wait in, their, in the emergency department for long periods of time. And then, and then what then further backs up are the ambulances who are arriving with patients um, who have to wait for long periods of time to offload their patients. And so uh, we think this is getting slightly better, um, but it is still a significant challenging challenge happening all across our state. And sadly, it is 
It does seem to be more challenging on the border in the border areas and on the east side of the Cascade Mountains in central Washington and eastern Washington, but it is definitely a significant problem also in western Washington. And so what are examples of what we are seeing? Just yesterday, there was uh, two gentlemen in their 50s, one who uh, originated uh, in a small hospital on the border of Idaho and who had COVID pneumonia and had to be uh, eventually put on a ventilator. And uh, the, the, the location we could find to care for this gentleman was all the way over in the Puget Sound area into, into Snohomish County. And there was another gentleman also in his 50s who showed up uh, more in the northern parts of central Washington at a very small critical access hospital. Again, we had to uh, move him just an extraordinarily long way into the Puget Sound area in order to find him the care that he needs. We are thankful that we are still finding capacity. We know that our neighbors to the north in Alaska and, 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 and Idaho and, and really all over uh, the U.S. are really struggling to find capacity. And, and, uh, and so we are pleased that when we can make that happen for people and get them the care they need, hopefully in an expeditious manner, but it, it remains remarkably challenging as all of our hospitals, our resource hospitals, those places that can provide that quote unquote fix are still remarkably overburdened. So thank you for the work, but I continue to plead with everybody to stay focused and to wear your masks, to please get vaccinated um, because we are, we are not done sadly, um, but we all look forward to the day when we can uh, resume our normal lives. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Um, Dr. Getz, I think that's a good segue into what's happening in Eastern Washington. I'd love to hear from you about your experiences there. Yeah, absolutely, Cassie. Uh, you know, as, as Dr. Mitchell mentioned, we're very, very busy. Uh, although we've seen a little bit of a plateau in our COVID admissions over the weekend, we're still at our all-time highs since the start of this pandemic. And although we're not practicing crisis standards of care medicine on this side of the state, we still feel like we're in crisis. And we've done lots of things to try and expand capacity within the hospital. Very, very difficult decisions, including pausing non-emergent surgeries, which is heart-wrenching for us to do when we have patients that have diseases that we can take care of, cancers and things that we're saying, well, maybe in two weeks we, we can do that surgery because right now we have to increase our capacity in our ICUs for these, these patients with COVID. Um, we continue to help our, our neighbors to the, the east in Idaho, and, and that's part of our mission is to care for the poor and the vulnerable, um, but it's challenging. We, we really do need the help of the community to get vaccinated, um, wear masks because we're tight, and I don't, you know, I don't know if we can continue to, to care for more and more patients in our community, um, but this is, it really is an issue related to vaccination and mask wear. So anything the community can do to help us would be greatly appreciated. Dr. Getz, I really appreciate your point with something we've said over and over again is this disease is a human fueled disease and it's a can be a human controlled disease and that the vaccination and mask wearing is really effective in keeping it from moving around. Um, Dr. Zier, I think we'd love to hear about what's happening and with, maybe we wouldn't love to hear this actually, we might find it chilling, what's happening with children um, across the state and then what, who you're, what, how you're seeing children, Seattle Children's. Sure, I can address what, what's happening at Seattle Children's. Uh, we continue to have a high emergency department census and a high occupancy rate for our staffed beds. Our COVID numbers are actually down a little bit, both our new positives and our hospitalizations for COVID. Um, at, at our high, at the end of August, beginning of September, we had about uh, between 10 and 13 uh, patients with uh, COVID-19 hospitalized at any given time. And the numbers are now around six to seven. So that, that's good news, especially with the start of school and concern around uh, numbers going up with that. We are seeing, so what are we seeing? We're seeing more RSV, we're seeing more um, other respiratory viral illnesses. We're uh, continuing to see a high number of uh, mental health admissions as well. Uh, we are monitoring the situation with the multidisciplinary team and addressing uh, flow issues. And we've been able to uh, keep our diverts down. So that's also good news. And I did want to return back to the um, 
uh, COVID-19 admissions, about half of the patients that we're admitting to the hospital are old enough to be vaccinated. And the vast majority of those patients are not vaccinated. So just circling it back to what others are saying, it's so important to um, prioritize getting vaccinated as soon as one is able. And if uh, children in your home are too young to be vaccinated, if we can vaccinate everybody around them and observe the um, strategies like mask wearing, we will go a very long distance in keeping the kids safe. And Dr. Zare, just to remind folks, can you uh, describe who is currently eligible of the pediatric population for vaccine? I just wanna make sure everyone, everyone understands this because we want as many kids as possible to get vaccinated. Yes, 12 and up. And um, I'm sure everybody was hearing in the news uh, that data on the five to 11 should be going to the FDA soon. Thank you. As a parent of a child in that five to 11 group, I can't, I can't come fast enough. Yeah. Um, and John, finally, let's hear how things are in Vancouver. Sure. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, my name is John Herson. I'm president of uh, Legacy Salmon Creek Medical Center here in Vancouver, Washington and Clark County. We're a 220 bed medical center, uh, part of a larger health system that serves the greater Vancouver and Portland markets. And as you've heard from my colleagues, um, you're going to hear the same uh, themes for, uh, from me as well. The impact of this particular variant uh, has been uh, has been and continues to be dire. Um, I'll, I'm going to do three things. I'll share uh, a couple of metrics uh, just to give you a state of the state uh, from uh, Salmon Creek's uh, perspective. Talk a little bit about staffing and also violence in the workplace, um, and then have a couple of asks uh, in terms of call uh, call to action. Um, so current state over the last 30 days, uh, August 15th through September 15th, we have averaged 63 COVID positive patients uh, in-house per day, just to give you order of magnitude. Uh, during some of the other surges, we ranged in the high 20s to low 30s. Um, so we were seeing essentially a doubling of what we had seen in the previous uh, surges. Um, so during this one month period, we've admitted 264 patients who were COVID positive. Average age was 57. Um, 87 of those patients, or about a third, uh, were under the age of 50. So we're certainly seeing a much different demographic uh, compared to the previous surges. And as my colleagues have noted, uh, certainly seeing much more prevalence in uh, younger adults and also kiddos uh, as well. Um, and as you have probably heard, over 90% uh, of those that are hospitalized are unvaccinated. Um, so we are certainly at capacity um, and it is uh, essentially clogging up the entire uh, system. Um, basically, we are housing patients in the emergency room that normally would be admitted for inpatient status and that then leads uh, downstream to extremely long waits for emergency room uh, care. Uh, most of the uh, COVID positive patients that are uh, needing critical care services are on ventilators. We have both an ICU and IMCU. We have 16 patients on ventilators and nine of which are, uh, are prone. Um, so hopefully that gives you a state of the state. In terms of staffing shortages and violence in the workplace, you know, we continue to deal with a situation where um, we're seeing extreme burnout and fatigue uh, from our clinical staff um, and support staff. Uh, many are uh, choosing to leave uh, the profession and obviously the mandate uh, will um, only cause others uh, to potentially leave uh, as well. Um, in addition to that, we deal with a lot of uh, verbal and sometimes physical abuse uh, from our community. Um, continued resistance to masking and visitor guidelines. Um, our screeners who are the front door uh, to our, our community um, are subject to uh, daily verbal and sometimes physical abuse and an unnecessary stressful uh, situation which wanes on, on each of those individuals every day. So our call to action you know, we are in crisis um, and we desperately need the community's help and the support to continue to um, uh, get through uh, the pandemic. Uh, first and foremost, if you're eligible, please get vaccinated uh, as soon as possible. It is safe, it is effective, and it clearly prevents hospitalizations so that we can have a bed uh, for you or your family member if, uh, if it's needed. Wear your mask um, indoors and outdoors. 
limit gatherings. And then finally, I'd ask for compassion for our healthcare workers, and both for those that are vaccinated and those that are choosing to uh, not be vaccinated. Um, everyone has been here uh, for their communities for the last 19 plus months. Uh, they deserve to be recognized for that service. Uh, we are doing our best to make sure that we are here for our communities um, and uh, some compassion for uh, the folks that are continuing to serve uh, would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I wanna just uh, highlight a couple of things that you said. One is the number of patients that are on a ventilator and prone. That means they are on their stomach and it is very, very challenging to flip a patient who's on a ventilator. It is a hugely staff intensive and kind of scary thing, I think, because there's so many tubes and uh, wires and breathing apparatus. You've gotta be so ex ex exceptionally careful. So that's a really, that's a really big deal. Um, and the second piece is, is what uh, John mentioned about the staff being um, harassed. And that is a huge challenge all around the state. Even if you're vaccinated and you think you're not sick and you're asked to wear a mask, you're asked to do that to protect others in the hospital. You could be sick. You might not be sick with COVID even. You might have something else you could have, as, as Dr. Zare mentioned, you might have RSV. So, um, you know, we are really would like people's cooperation to understand that we're doing everything we can to keep the hospitals functioning and to allow people to have visitors. There was a time period when people really couldn't have visitors. And so that's, it's important for visitors to be as kind as possible to those who are providing the, that screening. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, okay, I, the first question is about um, crisis standards of care. How close are we to crisis standards of care? Do we know how soon rationing could start? And if when rationing does happen, how are decisions made on who gets priority care? Um, I'm gonna actually ask Taya Briley, who is our executive vice president and general counsel, who's our leader on crisis standards to talk about this. But I, before I, Taya, before I hand it over to you, I wanted to um, make sure folks had read the letter from the medical executive committee at Providence Alaska Medical Center about what they're doing. It is a remarkable letter. And if you haven't read it, it's really worth reading. And so they say, at this time, we feel we have an ethical obligation to be transparent with our community and share with the public the distressing reality of what's happening inside the walls of our hospital. Um, and they say, I'm gonna skip some of this. Um, While we are doing our utmost, we are no longer able to provide the standard of care to each and every patient who needs our help. The acuity and number of patients now exceeds our resources and our ability to staff beds with skilled caregivers like nurses and respiratory therapists. We have been forced within our hospital to implement crisis standards of care. What does this mean? In short, we are faced with a situation in which we must, must prioritize scarce resources and treatments to those patients who have the potential to benefit most. We've been required to develop and enact policies and procedures to ration medical care and treatments, including dialysis and specialized ventilor, ventilatory support. Um, so I really would recommend you all read that because it's a, it's very sobering about what this looks like. And Tay, I'll hand over the, the uh, over to you for some comments. Thanks, Cassie. Um, so I want to emphasize that at this point here in Washington State, we have not triggered crisis standards of care, and. The main reason for that is that Washington hospitals have been able to work together to avoid having to go there. We have a lot of the same pressures on our hospitals as other states are facing. And um, we are able to, uh, through our collaboration, avoid crisis standards to date. Um, we are doing all that we can to keep from going there. We are, I at this point, what I would describe as providing um, high contingency care in a crisis, uh, but not providing crisis standards of care. Crisis standards of care is really a point where you are making a decision as Cassie just described in her letter about who is going to get a life-saving treatment and who is not going to get a life-saving treatment. And at this point, while there are delays in care and challenges with getting patients care, we have not yet had to go to a point where we are having to deny patients a treatment in order to give it to another patient. 
And one of the reasons for this is the work of the Washington Medical Coordination Center. You heard earlier today from Dr. Steve Mitchell describing um, the work of level loading in the state. And the hospitals in the state, the large hospitals in the systems, uh, health systems in the state have agreed that they will, um, as a measure of last resort, um, work uh, to implement a rotation of essentially guaranteed acceptance of patients to try and avoid going into crisis standards. And so um, we really um, appreciate the WMCC and the work that we are doing and really encourage this model for other states. Um, and we hope that it continues to be enough to keep us um, out of crisis standards. One of the questions that um, I saw in the chat was about uh, what criteria are used to determine crisis standards. I wanted to just talk about the model that we are using here in Washington state, which has been um, developed over the course of many years. I think it is one of the best in the nation and um, really want to uh, appreciate the Disaster Medical Advisory Committee, Northwest Healthcare Response Network and the Washington State Department of Health for their work on this particular set of documents. Um, it is really thoughtfully done with the work of clinicians and ethicists um, and uh, lawyers and uh, disability rights advocates. Um, and I think uh, is a model um, for others in the country and we don't ever want to have to use it. One of the hallmarks of using crisis standards of care uh, according to this uh, protocol that we use or would use in Washington state is that independent triage teams are, are convened to make decisions about who gets treatment and who does not. Um, that takes the burden of decision-making off of those clinicians that are actually providing care at the bedside with that particular patient. And some of the criteria um, about what uh, patient will get treatment and what patient will not has to do with what treatment is um, in need at that moment. And um, I am not a physician, uh, but I will just say that uh, for, as some examples of patients, renal function may be taken into consideration, their lung function may be taken into consideration. There are probably other clinicians on this call that could give you better indicators, but um, it is not um, something that is just made up on the fly. Um, it is something that is dictated in this protocol um, and takes the burden off of the clinicians that are already in a completely heart-wrenching situation. So I hope that helps get at some of the questions that were asked and I'm happy to um, help with other questions. Thank you, Taya. And there are some other, there are some follow-up questions about there's no formal declaration of crisis standards. Aren't hospitals having to do some level of prioritization? Um, yes, right now hospitals are, have canceled a ton of uh, what are called elective or non-urgent procedures. And just that we say this every time, elective does not mean a facelift. That's what we think people think when they hear elective, elective can be a whole bunch of things. It can be um, a heart valve replacement. It could be treatment for a um, slow growing cancer. Dr. Getz, I know you all have canceled just about everything. Can you give some examples of the kinds of things your cancel are, are postponing out in the e Eastern Washington? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, unfortunately a lot of cancer surgeries, and I, I think that's important to remember if, you, if you're a patient who's been recently diagnosed with cancer, and we have a way to cure that, remove that from your body surgically. And we call you and say, it's going to be two weeks till we can do that, or maybe three or four weeks. In that interim, you're agonizing. That's a diagnosis that redefines who you are. It's kind of all you think about until you get it treated. And, and that's what we're seeing. Our surgeons are passionately advocating for these patients, and it's heart-wrenching for them to feel like they can't take care of them. Lots of spine surgeries where people are in constant pain. They're not sleeping. They're in agony. And we can fix that. We can, we can provide comfort and we're having to pause that. Um, the measures that we're taking into place really to create capacity, we want people to realize that if you're really, really sick, we can care for you right now. We want you to come to the emergency department with your heart attacks and your strokes. And that was something that really worried us when we initially saw people too scared to come to the hospitals. We have capacity care for the sickest of the sick. In the meantime, we're still pausing those patients that have very real problems that we can take care of uh, as a result. And the way again forward is we need our community to step up and vaccinate. The reason we're in a worse situation in Eastern Washington than the West side of the state is we have lower utilization of vaccine. And it's not a border problem. It's not an issue with the border between Idaho and Washington. We simply, as Washingtonians in Eastern Washington, haven't got vaccinated in, in high enough uh, rates. And 
as a, a father of two teenage boys who are both vaccinated, I am also looking forward to my 10 year old daughter being able to get the vaccine. So this really, it has to be a community effort. It has to be a national effort. And we have to come together as Americans to end this. Thanks, Dr. Getz. Uh, okay, question about King County's vaccine verification mandate for indoor public spaces. Are, is the hospital association pushing for a similar statewide mandate? Yes, we have made that request um, of the governor. And then we are also going to, we have not yet done this, but we are going to be writing to all of the local health jurisdiction leaders around the state, urging them to Im implement a similar, to adopt a similar uh, vaccine verification uh, system. Anybody want to comment on that? I think we all think it would be a good idea. All right. Um, can we comment on the news from Pfizer today about five to 11 year olds getting one step closer to eligibility? I have a kid in this group. Dr. Getz sounds like you have a kid in this group. Uh, anybody else have a kid? Dr. Zara or John, do you have a kid in this group? Okay, so I know I'm really excited about it for sure. Dr. Mitchell um, does as well. Oh, Dr. Mitchell does as well, great. Um, so you got, you got three parents here who are gonna be, I think probably at the front of the line. Um, Dr. Zare, maybe you have comments. So those are our personal think, comments, but Dr. Zare, maybe yeah, uh, yeah. a professional and, comment. <laughs> yeah, I, I think pediatricians everywhere are also incredibly excited about this, this opportunity to directly protect uh, the younger age group. And I think uh, when we consider school settings, group settings, uh, it, it's just going to be a huge step forward for safety for the kids. Dr. Mitchell, any comment you want to make about your own family situation? Uh, no, I, 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 I'm very similar to Dr. Getz, and then I have two teenage boys who are both vaccinated, who uh, uh, are excited to be, and uh, uh, I can't tell you how many episodes of tears that I've, we've had in our house because uh, my 11-year-old daughter uh, just has not met that threshold yet, and uh, but she is the best mask wearer you have ever met. Um, and, uh, and so, and we will um, join the rest, everybody else in uh, celebrating when she can get vaccinated. All right, so all three of us have two children who are eligible, who are both vaccinated and one child who is not, who is not yet vaccinated. And it is a very stressful inter-family inter situation. I would agree with that. Um, you really want the whole crew to be vaccinated. Um, okay. A question about, I think I'm going to ask you all if you can talk about this. Um, there's a couple of questions about uh, people dying. Um, are hospitalizations trending downward? Would you say folks are getting better following guidelines as a prominent, predominant reason, or is it more people are dying? So are you seeing more of a, where are you seeing the decline? If you're seeing a decline in cases, is it fewer admissions or because the death rate is increasing? That's one part of the question. And the second part of the question is, what is the survival rate of someone who's put on a ventilator? And then maybe even more, what's the survival rate of someone who's put on a ventilator in the prone position? Dr. Getz, would, do you wanna take a stab at those? Sure, you know, we're, we're unfortunately, although we're, we're still at record levels of admissions for COVID-19 um, in our hospitals and, and death is, tends to follow admissions pretty late at two to three week um, window between those two usually. You look at national data, I think our mortality rate's pretty similar to what you see. And, and when you're put on a ventilator, the, the older you are, the less well you do on a ventilator. And a ventilator, a, it's, it's kind of the Hail Mary for, for COVID care at this point. And I would say the rates of mortality are roughly between 30 and 50% of these people that get put on a vent. And it's an agonizingly long process. And it really makes it challenging to move patients through an ICU. We had Sacred Heart at 54 bed ICU, and it's not been uncommon to see 20 plus patients in that ICU with COVID, many of whom are intubated and prone, which we released some, some footage uh, recently to the media, which shows what RN team members and techs have to go through to prone folks. It really is, it's just incredibly difficult to do. The amount of care that a sick COVID patient requires is just incredibly large. Um, and again, it highlights the importance that this is largely preventable. The vast majority of these patients should not be in hospitals if they were vaccinated. Almost never do we see a vaccinated patient on a ventilator for COVID. Anybody else wanna comment about, John, do you have comments about admissions versus 
death rates and the survival rate of people on ventilators? Yeah, I would say uh, for us, it, we've seen it's 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 a combination of both. It's hard necessarily to pinpoint uh, one or the other. Um, uh, certainly, I would agree with Dr. Getz in terms of what we're seeing um, and survival rate with uh, uh, folks that are on uh, on ventilators. You know, we certainly have seen um, uh, during the the last couple of surges. You know, when stricter. Um, uh, when there's more strict uh, rules around social gatherings and, and masking, you know, there is a, a cause and effect uh, to that. And I think we're starting to see that now that uh, some stricter measures have put in, been put in place uh, here in, uh, in Southwest Washington. Um, but I think we're also seeing that this particular strain is much more deadly than uh, than previous uh, previous ones and I'll, I'll make a comment about the the border um, uh, as well because uh, you know we are eight miles north of the the Oregon border and again we're part of a system where most of our sister hospitals are in uh, are in Oregon um, and we're certainly seeing the difference between uh, vaccination rates in the Portland metro area versus Southwest Washington. We are much lower than uh, uh, than the Portland metro area. And if you compare our COVID numbers uh, to my sister hospitals within the legacy system, we are far outpacing um, all of the. Uh, we have almost half of the COVID uh, positive patients in our system. And so cl a clear correlation between vaccination rate and uh, amount of hospitalization. Thank you, John. That's really interesting because I think we have focused on the concerns about Idaho patients coming here. But in fact, the Portland hospitals may be saying the same thing about us, um, about the South, Southwest Washington patients coming their way. Um, a question about, do we have an update on when the federal staffing that DOH had asked for will arrive? We do not. Um, no, I think we'd ask them that question. What we understand is initially the contract is for 1,200 staff and that the contractor is initially able to fill about a quarter of that request and is hoping to be able to fill more. But, I, but that's a good question for DOH. Um, a question about, uh, do we think, uh, we missed, uh, sorry, missed this on the uh, 12, and, 12 and under vaccinations, do we think parents who have children over 12 and have been waiting to vaccinate might vaccinate all their children at once? Hope so, but I'd rather those 12 and older, olders go ahead and get vaccinated today. Dr. Zare, you want to comment on that? No need to wait. Absolutely not. And in fact, I, I would hope everybody's thinking uh, really seriously if they've waited this long to go ahead, make the move and get it done now. I know I've seen lots of school um, vaccination clinics. That I, I feel like it's just everybody's doing as much as they possibly can to make it as easy, as easy as possible. Um, what do we think about so many people coming out of the Seahawks game not wearing their masks? Dr. Mitchell, you have any comment on that? Or Dr. Z Dr. Zare? Uh, I'll go ahead and start. I, I'll start by saying I'm an enormous Seahawks fan, and I watched the game yesterday from uh, from my home. And uh, you know, the uh, I was pleased uh, uh, re regarding the the, the vaccine uh, mandate I mean, as they as they apply to those large gatherings. But uh, I, I think the message just has to be the 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 virus is not a respecter of sports teams or college campuses or anything else. And so all of the gatherings that we have when we're in close proximity to people, especially when people are not vaccinated and not wearing masks, it increase our risks and, and, uh, and the chances of actually get, of getting COVID because you, you never ever know who, what's going on with the person next next to you or really with yourself with asymptomatic spread you may be spreading the disease to other people and have no idea and so i'm a huge fan i love i i uh, i i grew up in this city uh but i get very very concerned uh when i see those large crowds and i would add especially when people are you know, having a good time, cheering, you know, things like that, it, it does uh, further increase the risk. And, um, you know, additionally, people are really packed into those settings. And even when leaving, uh, people are in very close proximity with each other. Thank you. Okay, um, this is a, a 
John's call for compassion for hospital st staff who choose not to get vaccinated. How tolerant should hospitals be of employees who refuse to vaccinate in the face of the crisis? Um, we are really working with all of our staff to encourage them to be vaccinated to protect themselves and others and their families. We would like them to do so. We also are incredibly grateful for their service throughout the pandemic. Um, we don't have a choice about whether to keep those staff employed or not. Um, the governor's uh, order is clear on October the 19th. If they have not been vaccinated or granted an exemption, they are not able to work any longer in the hospital or long-term care setting. Anybody else want to comment on that? Okay, um, let's see. This is for Dr. Mitchell. Can you describe to what extent the WMCC is trying to ameliorate ambulance diverts and longer than normal transport times that are taking EMTs out of service in their home cities? Are there any new measures in place to address this trickle down or coming soon to address this trickle down effect of overburdened emergency rooms? Uh, that's a great question. And uh, as an emergency room physician, it's uh, and, and as a uh, person who worked as a paramedic for 15 years before going to medical school, it it uh, it uh, hits home with me. And so, um, the our opinion has been the best way to get those ambulances back in the streets is to try and offload all the all of the hospitals which are severely impacted and so we all, all of the work that we've been describing and trying to level load the entire state even out the burden but yet in, in tension with those patients who really need those critical critical needs getting them to where they need to go um, they're all they're all factoring in but but our primary strategy now is to try and level load the entire state of state of Washington and uh, we are also working, as, as the folks on this call know, uh, with WISHA and the Department of Health and the Healthcare Authority of trying to get patients out of hospitals to long-term and short-term care that can be safely, uh, safely transitioned to whose in, inpatient hospitalization or hospital needs have passed, but they still need help working to get those patients out. And then we are also really working hard to, uh, especially at the regional level, like in the Wenatchee area, in the Spokane area, working with the small hospitals and the big hospitals in those areas to try and actively get patients returned to their communities and to use thing, uh, beds called swing beds and, and, uh, and, and uh, the capacity that does exist in some small hospitals to be able to uh, alleviate the larger facilities because when you look at where the capacity is in our state it, it actually is in pockets in those smaller hospitals and so we're trying to leverage those things but then also just working with our ambulance companies and such to, to monitor the situation to try and figure out uh, and our emergency departments to monitor the situation and to figure out how Importantly, emergency departments can stay off of diversion, which really strands those ambulances and uh, when they have no place to go. And but uh, the number one thing is making sure those hospitals kind of our state as much as possible stay out of crisis so those ambulances can come and there's availability in the emergency department. They can offload their patients and then return back to uh, responding to 911 calls. Thank you. And I want to really emphasize one thing that Dr. Mitchell said, which is that that work to find placements more quickly for people who have completed their acute care treatment, some of whom are very complex, some of whom are not. And it, it, they just have a delay of two or three or four days while the insurance company responds, for example. Um, to move those people as quickly as possible is a huge deal. And we should never go into crisis standards for people who need acute care because we are caring for too many people who no longer have any acute care needs. That's a really critical piece at the and a, a, our most important point of advocacy for the state. Um, a question regarding booster shots. Do we think we should be more concerned with vaccinating the unvaccinated or getting the third shot for folks who have already been inoculated? I say both. Anybody? I mean, we want we want those who who especially when the if you see the immunity waning and people who are most vulnerable, people over sixty five, we want them to be protected as much as they can, and we want to vaccinate the unvaccinated, and we've got plenty of supply in America. Anybody else want to comment on that? No, I, I would just agree with you, Cassie, that uh, um, the 
there, um, if I had to choose, I would, I would definitely choose the folks who have, have chosen to receive no protection at this point, that uh, uh, it's kind of the fallacy is that their own innate immune system can somehow uh, uh, combat the virus. And, and we see, um, as Dr. Getz had mentioned earlier, uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, so many patients, uh, uh, you know, around 90% of our patients in my hospital are not vaccinated. And it is so hard for staff to constantly be taking care of patients over and over again who are incredibly ill. And it's seen as something that is preventable in most circumstances. And so I would choose those patients who not been vaccinated yet, but, uh, but, but definitely follow the, all the recommendations coming from the CDC. Thanks Dr. Mitchell. Okay, if crisis standards, this is, this, is, this is a hypothetical, it actually really isn't, it could be for real. If crisis standards are invoked, would you consider withholding care from COVID patients whose survival is doubtful? How much does that human element of caring for people who aren't vaccinated play in decision, into decisions involving scarce medical resources? As Taya described, and Taya, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong or jump in, crisis standards of care would be rolled out based on um, some objective assessments of function. So it could be like your kidney function or your lung function. So whether or not you are vaccinated would not be a trigger for crisis standards, but not being vaccinated makes it more likely that your kidney function is terrible and your lung function is terrible. So as we've heard from everyone, the number of patients who are vaccinated who end up on ventilators is tiny. So it would be un unlikely that anyone who is vaccinated would actually ever get to the crisis standards point. We well, just want to answer that, Cassie. Yeah, please. Dr. Dr. Question. We, we would never withhold care for somebody because they made a decision not to get vaccinated. In healthcare, we that human element, we would never judge somebody based off their decisions that leads them to seek care. We're here to take care of sick people. Thank you, Dr. Getz, that's a really important clarification. And I wanna also note that hospitals take care of a lot of people who make choices that others might uh, uh, object to, you know, eating a cheeseburger every day or riding a motorcycle without a helmet. Um, and we do not do a triage at the ER and say, you motorcycle rider had a helmet on, you did not. And so we're only gonna treat you with a helmet. Um, uh, what do we know about natural immunity for people who have had COVID previously? And for those who got sick last year are, with the pre-Delta variant, are they, at, are they at risk for reinfection? Dr. Getz or Dr. Mitchell, wanna take that? I think, you know, what we are seeing, what we do know is that people that recovered from COVID and then choose to be vaccinated have a much more vigorous response in antibody production. They're probably the, the most protected people out there. And there's a lot of talk about this hybrid immunity, where if you got vaccinated and then were exposed to COVID, you're going to make antibodies to things other than just that spike protein. One thing that's incredibly important to realize is the vaccination is very, very safe in people that recovered from COVID. Two, it gives you the best protection. So we really do encourage those people that have recovered to get vaccinated because we just don't know how long cellular immunity lasts. And we certainly see breakthrough cases of infection, you know, eight months out where people come back again. So if you're at risk, we want to keep you as safe as possible. I uh, completely agree with Dr. Getz. And I would just, uh, I think probably one of the best pieces of evidence came out of the, uh, and it's publicly available, uh, uh, if you want to reference an August 6th MMWR uh, paper that was done where the, 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 in the state of Kentucky, they looked at just this question and they, I think, really sh clearly showed that when, um, when you both have been infected and then get vaccinated, your chances of whether it's the um, the original uh, uh, variant or the current Delta variant that you are still uh, much better protected when you do get both. And, and so I recommend it to all my friends and my family to regardless of whether you've had COVID or not to please get vaccinated. Thank you. Okay, now Dr. Zer, can you, uh, Zer, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm reading it wrong. Sorry, Dr. Zare. Can you help us understand the timeline for when Pfizer could become available for ages five to 11? And do you expect it to be a smaller dose? Um, and will, will we use the already manufactured Pfizer vials or will it be a different vial? 
So great questions. Um, my understanding of the timeline is that uh, the FDA should be receiving the data from Pfizer by the end of September. And then um, hopefully we would hear something from the FDA a few weeks after that. So sometime in October. I believe the dose is is smaller. Um, I know I read what it is. I think it's it's half to a third of of what the adult dose is, I think. Um, and I don't know the, the answer to that question if we'll be using the um, original vials or if there'll be different vials. Since they're multi-dose vials, I would imagine we could use the original vials. It would just be instructions or different syringes that might come into play. I don't know if anybody knows more about that. No. Um, I'm willing for my kid to be filmed getting a shot. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Getz and Dr. Mitchell might be as well, as well if y'all are looking for media, media uh, roles on the very first day of the shot being released. Um, I think I've gotten through all the questions. So thank you all. Oh, hey, one more. Do hospitals have projections for this fall and winter for inpatients? And is there concern that capacity is going to be challenged with the flu season? There is, yes, a ton of concern about the flu season and the ongoing COVID cases. We don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know if we're gonna get another variant. Um, it feels like a Petri dish of uh, Greek alphabet letters headed our way. Dr. Mitchell, any thoughts about your winter, your winter thinking? No, we. Well, I think what we've learned more than anything else is that uh, this is un, so unpredictable, and so I would have, I, I, I never would have in the second week of July when we were sitting at around 235 hospitalized COVID patients in in our state, have predicted that that just six or eight weeks later we would we we would have more, we'd be 50% above what our previous high peak was. That's how fast things can change. And so we have to respect this virus and, and, and appreciate how things fat change so dramatically and so quickly and build the structures to be able to respond to it. That's what's actively going on. And we've done a great job in our state. And so, um, and so, but when you do combine those things with schools reopening and the, the, the flu season, which we all believe is going to be a significantly worse than last year, given what was going on in our, uh, in our world, uh, we are very, very concerned. Get your flu shot, get your COVID vaccine and your flu shot. All right, with that, um, I think we will close and we will see you again next week. And we are going to be hopeful that the cases will continue to decline in a way that we might not need to have a media briefing every week. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Take care.